The torches. In this episode, we are joined with Scott Manning to discuss the end of the Hundred Years' War and the role that Joan of Arc had in the French military campaigns against the English. Scott Manning is an independent scholar and historian and the author of Joan of Arc, a reference guide to her life and works. Scott has also published papers and studies in medievalism, the year's work in medievalism, and film and history. Scholarly interests include how the past is portrayed in pop culture, particularly medievalism in movies and television, and he holds a master's in history and bachelor's in military history from American Military University. Scott, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. So yeah, I figured we might just dive right into the subject matter. Um, I, well, I figured first maybe we, we, we give some background information to, before we discuss Joan of Arc herself. Um, okay. Because as, as I understand it, Joan of Arc is coming, of course, out of a very long conflict and dispute between France and England, uh, and it's known colloquially as, colloquially as the Hundred Years' War. What can you say to that? <laughs> yeah, I, I I always love to talk about the Hundred Years' War that lasted for 116 years and right, 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 right. remind people to not miss that on Jeopardy when it comes up. Uh, it, the Hundred Years' War is really interesting because, yeah, you mentioned the, the name we gave it. I mean, I, that obviously comes well after the fact uh, from the Victorian era where people were trying to like name this period of sets of wars and conflicts, mm -hmm. mainly between France and England, but they tried to loop in everyone they could in the region. And if you read some other papers or some other works written on it, people say, look, it wasn't just a war. This was many wars wrapped into one. Right, right. And when it comes with disputes between France and England, as we call them, I'm using that in quotation marks mm -hmm. to, to group them. Uh, I mean, it, it lasts well before and well after that period. Uh, but the Hundred Years' War is particularly interesting because it's usually centered around a very specific dispute over the French throne, uh, mm. dating well before Joan of Arc was born. And when she came around, that that Hundred Years' War had been going for a long time. Um, as she got older and became of age in her teenage years, it, it heated up even more. And that's just how you see the war over the years. It, it ebbs and flows. There's periods of peace. Uh, and, you know, definitely people living at that time didn't think, man, I'm in a really long period of war. That's got to be like 100 years. Right. Right. Yeah, we do need to remember that all these labels that we project onto history are really just a result of historiographical provenance there. They're, they're not what they called their their, their wars or, or their events. Like, I did want to ask though, I mean, was that the case with respect to uh, the, the War of the Roses? Because that's a really pretty like way of describing the war. It's like, oh, it's the War of the Roses. Like, I remember uh, Dr. Kelly DeVries came on and, and we talked about the War of the Roses, but I, I don't know if, was it Tudor Chroniclers that came up with that name? Because that's a pretty cool name, let me just say. That, that is a good name. I, so I, I don't, I hadn't researched where that name came from, but if I was going to market a war for a larger audience, I'd definitely include a flower in it for sure. 100 Years War just sounds like a long time. You're right, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and in fairness, it was. And, and But in addition to the conflicts between England and France, there's also sort of internal conflicts going around at, at, at this time, um, during Joan of Arc's time? What, 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 what can you say to that? As I understand it, it was there were debates about uh, support over the Dauphin, about, about whether or not he, he should be king, and there were some that were more loyal to him, some who opposed him, and there was also that kind of internal conflict. Yeah, that, that internal conflict dates, dates well before Joan of Arc. And, I mean, weirdly, we could go back before Charles VII or the Dauphin as... as he was called off to then uh, to Charles the sixth and things really, things really took a turn for him uh, because he, he was not well and he was suffering from mental illness. Most people today diagnose it as uh, schizophrenia, uh, but he went through periods of, of great lucidity and then periods where he, he was not capable of doing anything. Um, it, it's really sad and tragic when you read about it. Uh, but it started to afflict him as he got into his 20s. And 
it started to come more often as he got older. And there's even descriptions of him walking around his residence and not even recognizing his wife. Uh, so that's kind of that's kind of the crux where, where things got difficult because with the king out of it, all his brothers, cousins, uncles, who were all the dukes in France, started vying for power and jockeying with each other and some alling with each other uh, until it started getting into stronger disputes and ultimately broke out into a civil war. Mm. So in from 1407 through um, 1435, 36, there was what we would just call a French civil war, regardless of the larger hundred years war. And that war was going on before Joan was born and before the English had really kicked up their war with the French again. And that it was that war that really allowed someone like Henry V to see an opportunity in France and come in and, and invade and cause havoc and, and make strides in the country like he did. And he conducted several campaigns. Of course, Agincourt is the one we, we always talk about and know, know about, but uh, he eventually conquered Normandy in the north. Uh, he was able to create an alliance with the Burgundians who were one of the dukes and one of the brothers of of Charles VI and basically keep them on his side. And then also on the northwest side, there was Brittany. And over there, the duke often found a way to either side with it, stay on the side that was the strongest or at least stay neutral or autonomous so he didn't have to get too involved. So you have a situation where basically like what we look at today is all of Northern France was either hostile or uh, neutral or you know just didn't care uh, against what we would call traditional France with the Dauphin and, and Charles the Charles the seventh. Mm. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's a lot of dispute there. And so, so Henry V was able to secure treaties. He was able to, uh, through, through the Civil War, he was able to convince Charles VI uh, to essentially disown Charles VII as the, the rightful heir to France. And Henry became the adopted son of Charles VI through marriage and through treaty, and then even had it so his, his children would be the rightful heirs of, of the French throne. It gets really confusing at this time because there's so much of the stuff going on. And one of the problems that England had for securing this, although they were able to get a lot of French on their side, is Henry died and then Charles VI died. And there wasn't a situation where uh, Henry technically inherited the throne from Charles VI as a, an adopted heir. Right. Because he died before Charles did. Right. I mean, how how old is Henry the Sixth when his father and and, and the French king passed he was an away? Infant. You're right, was, right. Okay, so that's not a promising start for you know the ruler of France. No. <laughs> right, right. So th so this is in 1422, and Joan of Arc herself at this point would have been we roughly nine years of age. Um, with the death of of Henry the Fifth and then Charles the Sixth, and that happened with roughly within a month of each other. You had an infant child as the quote unquote heir to the throne. And so there were regents put in place. So the Duke of Bedford, who was Henry the fifth brother, mm. he took over as regent of France. Uh, and then even Henry, Henry's brothers, one taking over in France, one taking over in England, they were they were disputing with each other. So everyone was disputing and and debating and arguing with each other over everything in this war. I see. I see. Now, I, I figured maybe we could back up a little bit and talk more about the uh, the dispute that originally happens between the English, the English king, and then the French king over the throne. How does that come about? Does it start with Henry V and Agincourt, or does it have a, a larger historical, you know, perspective? Like, what, what can you say to that? So that that began back in the 1300s uh, with with uh, the English and the French kings disputing with each other. There's there's a lot wrapped into it, but there was debate over how the French throne could be passed down from. From uh, to an heir, uh, mm. whether or not it could be passed through uh, the female side of a bloodline versus the male side of a bloodline, right? And there was essentially English kings just taking advantage of a situation and and pushing a cause, saying that they should be the rightful king of of England through all these you know different ways that people thought of how to how to inherit thrones, right? And that that's essentially where it started, and it just kept going, and. Early on, England was able to get a foothold in the continent 
uh, there's Calais in the north and then down in the south uh, in uh, in different regions. And so they were always there. Um, and there was always that opportunity to re-spark the war. And so whenever there's a border dispute or something going on and you have the right king in place who could convince parliament to give them funding to go and conduct a campaign, like this would happen. Right. And it happened through Edward III and then his son, the Black Prince. And and that that went for a time until eventually they moved on or passed. And um, it was just a very very much a, an ebony and flowing like that. And But it always came back to who should be the rightful heir to the throne of, of France. Right, right. I mean, I know that obviously the, the kingdoms of, of France and England have a very, very rich history that goes back well before the Hundred Years' War. And there's already kind of a tension between them over the issue of like vassalage, because technically, as I understand it, the king of England is supposed to be like a vassal and subservient to the king of France because of the, of how historically that all panned out. Is, is that correct? Or maybe the, maybe the, the, that's how the French king would want it to pan out, but that might not have been how it happened in reality. Yeah, it. It. I mean, we. So a lot of times we we try to like, we try to make sense of stuff because it's it's very foreign to us as in, in modern day. But like hmm. those types of statements and those types of of documents or understandings, like those were always up for interpretation and always sure. up to who could assert the power. Right. And and going going to any certain point, it's always going to go back to who you know who's the strongest or who has the influence or who has the right allies. To be able to assert that sort of authority, and even even after the Hundred Years' War, I mean, you, you have a situation where the the kings of England always refer to themselves as the kings of England and France uh, until the Napoleonic era. Right. And I think right. I think King King George III might have been the last or, or to do it, or he, he was the first one who did. I can't remember which one, but it went well into the eighteen hundreds. Oh, well, that's very um, interesting because, I mean, as, as we're going to talk about, I think with the exception of Calais, like the, the English are kind of taken away from, from from whatever control they had over France, but they're still going to refer to themselves nominally as, oh, yeah, France, that belongs to us. Interesting. Yes. Hmm. And I don't know if they say it like it belongs to us, but they just, you know, as they were crowned and referred to it, you know, the United Kingdom, King of England and France. And OK, yeah. interesting. OK. All right. Well, then I guess maybe we, we could uh, dive right in closer to uh, the time that Joan of Arc uh, was alive and kicking. H at the time of Joan of Arc, how many territories and cities, how many of them were occupied and controlled by, you know, Anglo-Burgundian? How, how much control did they have over France during Joan of Arc's time? Well, so and that was something that progressed uh, during her lifetime because she, she was born right before uh, Henry V came over to the continent. Mm. Um, but while she was young, I mean, Henry would have conquered all of Normandy. Uh, he would have signed an alliance with Burgundy, who was also trying to expand territory. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, depending on which book you read at what point in history, like Brittany was either considered an ally or um, they were at least agnostic or autonomous in the situation, but they had, they had several alliances at certain points or several treaties with the uh, the English and the Burgundians. So, I mean, if you look at if you look at a map, you know, a lot of people draw it's most of northern France is hostile or not friendly to Charles the Seventh and his kingdom okay. and the rest of France. I mean, are any of them though dissuaded by the fact that the 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 heir to the French throne is a, is an infant? I mean, did, does that change their perspective at, at all about who who should who who they should support or how, how does that work out? So that's a great question, and the, and. This time's pretty uh, aggressive in terms of trying to shore up support for um, England as being the, or the English king being the rightful heir. Mm. Uh, there are moments in, in time where they would go into universities or they would go into cities and they would, ha they would have people basically give loyalty oaths. They would say, hey, are you loyal to the, you know, the king of France, the rightful heir, and to Regent Duke Bedford? And they would do this in Paris and they would do this at the University of Paris. And then they would go to another town and do something similar. And these like kept reoccurring. So in terms of like how they felt or what their perspective was, like what we know is, is that there was an aggressive campaign to make sure that their, their feelings were put in paper and writing. Um, mm, right. And there were, there were people who were put on trial for pushing against that sort of thing. So, um, but what we glean as, as, as time went on based on, writings and things like that a lot of the the people in these areas had come to accept it or understand it as this is the way or 
um, they understood it as th this this is this is the way and to dispute it is just going to continue the war even longer mm, right so like let it go right so i guess maybe there were folks on, on either side that wanted to maybe keep the peace and continue with the trajectory for certain, of how for certain. Are going. And, and that's one of the charges against joan is that she wanted to continue the war mm, interesting but i but we might be jumping ahead there no 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 that, that's totally fine <laughs> and, and and then if, if i may ask i mean okay so we've set the scene uh, both the kings are dead. There's Henry VI, still relatively young uh, during this time. And we we, we know that Charles the, the, the Seventh, he's the Dauphin, and he's technically has a claim to the, to the throne, but... Well, he, much... So he calls himself the king. Okay. When, he already when when prior to his coronation, he's on the king. Okay. And that's really interesting. I, and I, and I, depending on which history book you read, like the, the, the cliff note version is, oh, he's the Dauphin. He doesn't become the king until Joan marches into Reims and sees him crowned properly. But right. in 1422, when his father died, they crowned him king. Okay. And he referred to himself as King Charles, as did everyone who worked with him. Others derided him, either called him the Dauphin, or they said the man who considers himself king, like they would use that type of verbiage. Right, but right. to him, he was the oldest son still alive, and he was the king. Right. Right. I guess it, it depends on, on who you ask uh, prior to, uh, you know, the the, 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 the uh, his official coronation about whether or not he's a king. It's more of an exercise in a political uh, rhetoric because yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm and, sure yeah. and the coronation helped, by the way, like that, that definitely swayed some things because he had some military successes before then. And then he had to march into hostile territory. But like that act of being crowned at Reims did have an effect, mm. um, not just in Reims, the city, but like cities around it as well there's even uh we even have examples of people who are writing at the time that refer to him as either the dauphin or just by his name and started referring to him as the king mm -hmm. uh, even if they were in territory controlled by the english or the burgundians so it, it definitely had a, an effect that way but obviously he wasn't controlling what he would consider his full kingdom of france in, uh, immediately okay interesting all right then uh then I guess we could maybe switch to, uh, course and talk more about, you know, Joan of Arc. Uh, what exactly do we know about Joan of Arc's early life and upbringing? I mean, we, we know that she's growing up during this this conflict and this war, but did any members of her family have any military experience or familiarity with war? Like prior to her, her, her involvement, d what experience would she have had with the war? Uh, that so that's that's a fascinating question. So in terms of her family, there's no evidence that we have that anyone that she knew would um, had any military experience. And so what we know about her childhood to answer the first part, we so we know her her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. aunts and uncles, even godparents. Uh, we know some of them by name and even have statements from them um, after she after she passed. Uh, we know she grew up on a farm. Uh, people like to refer to her as a poor peasant, but historians will tell you. They were not poor, like father owned land, owned animals, and even had representation in political affairs for the, the town. Mm. Um, so she would have been, she would have been around that, been exposed to animals. But in terms of like exposure to the war and military things, um, everyone obviously would have encountered, had some familiarity with the war. There, there's accounts of her and her family having to flee because Burgundians were raiding the town. Um, and then when she went to, other nearby towns where there was more traffic, she would have she would have encountered soldiers. Uh, there were also been um, itinerant preachers coming in, talking about the war, pushing a very monarchist view of what they thought of Charles VII and how he's the rightful king of France. So she would have been exposed to a lot of this stuff. Right. Um, and and a great uh, a great writing on this. I know. I know you probably want to talk about writings at some point, but Gail Orgelfinger, she she published uh, Joan of Arc in English Imagination. The first chapter is, is dedicated to Joan and what she thought of the English. Mm. And she covers a lot of like these opportunities that Joan would have had to have been exposed to information about the war in the English. So she knew what was going on. So she would have heard of, of Agincourt. She would have heard of the conquest of Normandy. Like this would have been stuff she would have been exposed to. Right, but in terms right. of military training from her family, th there's there's none that we have any evidence for whatsoever. And then with respect to the place that Joan of Arc grew up, um, wh wh where exactly did she did she grow up? What, 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 what was uh, the, the province or, or town that she lived in? Was it significant politically? Was it under the control of 
you know, Angler Burgundian forces at that time. You know, what, what can you say to that? So Domremy is the town, um, was part of Lorraine, which was the duchy uh, controlled by the Duke of Lorraine. Charles II, not to be confused with Charles VII, these names get confusing right. sometimes. But so that duchy, it, we refer to it as being on the frontier of France, Burgundy, 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 sorry, and the Holy Roman Empire. And we say the frontier because that duchy was not, it wasn't even connected to part of what would have been considered Charles VII's territory. Mm -hmm. so it was kind of surrounded by either hostile or, you know, not not France. Um, it's kind of like so, backwoods. But, but that's, well, maybe not backwoods, but like like out in the outskirts of... Yes, yeah. To get to it, it's going to be a hall and you're going to go through enemy territory. Okay. Like that's, that's the issue. But um, in terms of, of significant politically, it was, it was significant in the sense that any one of those dukes or an emperor uh, would have had, a, you know, either a strong or mild claim to the territory and would have been interested in what's going on there. There was also some nearby roads that, you know, they would have been the crossroads for trade and, and people coming in. Mm -hmm. um, but that was that duchy and the, the duke, they were all loyal to uh, Charles VII. Okay. So that was probably the most significant part. Um, but that Duke was was having, I mean, he was having to weigh a situation where if he if he was attacked by uh, Burgundy, um, he's he's on his own initially for sure. Right. Um, and he's also having interactions with the Holy Roman Empire, which is interested in what's going on in his territories, interacting with Burgundy and others. So uh so significant politically, just, there would have been a lot of political interaction, but I mean, it was it was a very, uh, very interesting territory to be living in at the time, for sure. Right, right. OK. And then another question I wanted to ask you about was uh, with respect to Joan of Arc. She herself claimed that she 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 she, she had heard voices and, it, and maybe even had seen visions uh re regarding things and 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 and, and goading her to, to 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 do certain activities and w um what were the contents of these visions and, and and the voices that that she was was say that she was purported to have heard what were, were they significant to her did they say anything in particular now you know? know the good stuff yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh so i so i like to kind of start by like what she shared initially because jo joan wasn't forthcoming with what she encountered or saw with with people she first interacted with so mm -hmm. What we do know is that at age 13, she encountered what she initially just referred to as her voices. Mm. And she was very clear in that these voices were giving her uh, commandments, telling her to uh, stay dedicated to God, keep her virginity, very, you know, Christian-like mm. things to do. Mm. When she got older, when she got to be about 16, they started giving her directions, telling her to get involved with the war. Interesting. And so, and, and without sharing with anyone what these voices were, she just said they were her voices. And the contents of them that, that she then started sharing with people were uh, go, go, go talk to the local captain at a nearby town and get him to send you to, to meet with the king mm. so you can help him claim his, his kingdom of France. Right. You know, it's, it gets very specific about, about these sorts of things. About these sorts of claims. Okay. And and do, does she name, does she give any names of who she thinks uh, are, are the voices? Like, does she identify them with any sort of like popular hagiographical traditions or, or narratives? Of, like, so you... she, she didn't, so that there are people who claim that she did when, when, before she was captured. Okay. Um, we don't have record of her talking about it. Or the earliest record we have of her naming names was during her trial. Okay. when her the uh, the assessors were grilling her on it and she initially wouldn't tell them hmm. uh, but she eventually shared that when she first encountered her voices it was the archangel archangel michael uh saint catherine and saint margaret okay okay um all three would have been significant at this time right um saint michael's really interesting because he had become essentially the the patron saint or representative that that Charles VII started flying on his banners whenever he was involved with the war. Right. And uh, and and then the other two women, uh, Margaret and, and Catherine of Alexandria, are also significant because they're they're symbolic they, they they represent the sort of hagiographical tradition of like uh virgin saints, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yeah, so bo both women were beheaded. Um, one was was tortured and then beheaded. Right. Uh, of course, St. Catherine's the, the funny one because she's one of the saints that gets beheaded, picks up her own head, and then walks somewhere before she... Right, um, right, right lays to rest and that, and that becomes like a, a holy spot you know that's we have several saints with it with that story which is always great mm. um saint catherine she was beheaded because she wouldn't marry a roman soldier who was a okay. pagan at the time okay um but they were significant in lorraine so saint catherine was a patron saint at a nearby chapel outside of domremy um and saint catherine um she was I'm sorry, Saint. I'm sorry, Saint Margaret was a patron saint of. Uh, can't remember what I just said. No, it's, <laughs> no, it's, it's like all right. In down room. All right, so Saint Catherine was the patron saint of a nearby chapel outside of Domremy. There has been a statue of her. Okay. So, like Joan would have seen that at the time, um, and then Saint Catherine was a patron saint of a nearby chapel. Uh, saint Michael, there would have been. I actually had the number written down because I was thinking about this. Uh, there was 46 sanctuaries in Lorraine that were dedicated to St. Michael. Oh, wow. Okay. So popular local saint, definitely. Okay. Popular local saint. And St. Michael was, was getting more traction because he had just recently replaced St. Dennis as kind of the representative of the king oh. in, in war. And, and St. Dennis had slowly started to fall out of favor. But once uh, the town of St. Dennis outside of Paris was taken over by the English and the Burgundians, Charles the seventh switched to St. Michael officially. Right. And that became his, his saint. I see. Okay. So, so the, 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 the people she's identifying with the voices, they're very significant politically and they're very significant for the town in which she's, she, she's growing up in. Absolutely. And they, and they would have been known to not only people in, in the town, but anyone she would have interacted with would have been familiar with these names. Okay. Okay. And then if I then may ask, how exactly did Joan become involved initially in the French military campaigns? And, and why did French commanders and leaders put so much, maybe not initially, but, but, but eventual confidence in her? Well, definitely not initially. Right, right, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, so, so Joan was, we, we, we think the first time Joan went to go talk to Robert de Badgercourt, who was the local captain in uh, Vuculaire, um, she went to him, told her, told him of her mission and asked him to send her to the king. He assaulted her and sent her home. And there are okay. some historians who have like kind of glossed over this, said he gave her a spanking or something like that. But she's a 16 year old girl. He hit her and sent her home. So that was her first interaction with trying to interact with a soldier about her mission. Um, and I kind of do an exercise with with folks that I, I know or work with. And I, I said, imagine you're at your job and a 16 year old comes in saying they've heard voices from God and they need to talk to the CEO about the direction of the company. Can you broker that meeting? Right. You'd probably call security or try to find their parents, right? Like, right, exactly. <laughs> so that, that was that was Robert de Badgercourt's first reaction. So, okay. And so jo Joan was out. Now she came back. Uh, so, so we think that was in May of uh, 1428. Mm -hmm. um, the next time she came back, we, we tend to date that around December or January of 1428. We don't have the exact dates because at the time, Joan wasn't significant. So there weren't a lot of people recording things that were happening. We're trying to peel this back based on testimony we got later after Joan had been around. Right. Um, so that that's in that's in May of fourteen twenty eight the first interaction she comes back in December that year or January the following year to try again. Um, in between that time, several things had happened. There was a strong campaign from the English pushing south into Charles's territory, and they had captured a lot of cities uh, to the point where they were, there was one major stronghold north of the Lower River um, that that was still loyal to Charles and, and resisting the English. So that had happened. There had also been some excursions by the Burgundians down into uh, Lorraine that Robert de Badgercourt would have had to deal with and interact with. Um, so he had had more conflict going on. Okay. Um, there's stories of Joan going to meet the Duke of Lorraine and talking with him personally. And that was, that was brokered by Robert de Badgercourt we believe because 
the Duke of Lorraine heard, heard that there's this woman who claims to be hearing voices from God and mm. there's something about her. You need to meet her. And so she had met with him. And then she came back for a third time to meet with Badger Court. Uh, and the story is that Badger Court showed up with a priest who threw holy water on her and was trying to do a quick exorcism. She, of course, stood there and said, you know, what are you doing? And I'm still here. And there's, <laughs> still here. There's, there's, there's different accounts of what she said. Um, several people said that she evoked a prophecy that was really popular at the time, talking about a woman from the marshes or frontier of Lorraine who would save France um, and different versions of it. But, you know, right. it's uh, some prophecies that that were were known at the time and some that were cobbled together based on statements from like Merlin and Bade and, and the Sybil prophecies that were kind of mixed together and used and packaged with Joan as well. But right. she evoked this prophecy and he broke down and decided to send her to meet with the king. And not only did he do that, he wrote a letter of recommendation, which apparently was instrumental just to get, get Charles to meet with her. Oh wow! So that was her first, like trying to get soldier, a soldier to, believe in her and, and support her okay so joan is off she she she, she gets to the Dauphin and the king uh she has this letter of recommendation what does the king do i mean this, this has got to be a very odd situation where uh this <laughs> this this, the, the, this woman <laughs> from 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 the frontier is coming saying i'm hearing visions from god yeah so she showed up the so the interesting part about it is she did not immediately meet with the king he made okay. her sit for a couple days and this fits in with the approach that was used with her before they 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 bought into her mission. So he she got she made it to uh, Chinon where the the king was at the time. Hmm. Um, spent a good a good amount of days trekking through something like 130 miles through Burgundian territory to get there. Um, and he kept her waiting. Now that that was a tactic that was used to like and. There's there's a lot written about this by theologians at the time and even before then of like, what do you do when someone walks in and says they have a voice or a vision from God for mm. someone in in royalty? Right. How do you handle it? The first tactic is to make them wait. And the idea is that if they're hearing voices from the wrong source uh, or they're lying, time will reveal that. Right. Because and, and, they, can't, they can't keep. Can't, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I, and I, if I remember correctly, that's also the, a tactic that was used for uh, novitiates and uh, people who wanted to enter the monastery or or the, or, uh, the mendicant orders that they'd say that they'd refuse them and send them away. And if they returned or if they were persistent, I was like, OK, maybe this guy might be a, a good fit for the order. Right. right, right. <laughs> it's it's a, it's a great tactic because, mm. yeah. And so that so initially she couldn't even meet with the king for a couple of days. Um, and when she did and she met with him, um, there's all kinds of of. You know, we may, th I, some people think they're apocryphal stories, but they're, they're stories of the king swapping his wardrobe with someone, but her still immediately recognizing him. Mm. Um, there's also a story of where she was able to speak with him alone and said something to him that just completely convinced him of that she was real. But regardless of any of that, uh, she's, he still sent her to go meet with a group of theologians for 11 days mm. and they grilled her. Right. And they did they did slowly and methodically again with the idea of like, let's give this time. Can right. she keep this up for the next couple of weeks? Right. Right. Um, and okay. she was getting very frustrated waiting. But her what what she said of why she was there and what she was meant to do didn't change. And those theologians couldn't find anything wrong with her. Right. And what what she told them when they when they asked her for a sign from God, she said, send me to Orleans. And I will show you a sign. And she kept emphasizing she will lift the siege of Orleans from the English. Mm, right. And so those theologians sent her back to Charles and said, we can't find anything uh, unholy or wrong about her. Send her to, we recommend sending her to Orleans so she can show her sign. Right. right. Well, it's interesting that you said that they found nothing wrong with her uh, uh, theologically, because I did want to ask, at what point did Joan... Famously, Joan of Arc uh, cross-dressed. Uh, at what point did Joan of Arc begin to wear men's clothing? And, and, and was this ever a sticking point when she met with the university theologians? Now, now, you're, now you're into the spicy stuff. Right, uh, right. <laughs> so she first put on men's clothing when she left uh, Vuculaires to go to Chinon. Okay. And it was 
a practical idea. And I don't even think it was her idea based on what we know. It sounds like people suggested you should switch into men's clothing because if people find this group of, of knights right. and squires, they, they're all squires, but a squire at the time was just a knight without the title. Um, and they see you with this girl, there's going to be questions and sure. if they heard about you coming. Sure, 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 sure. It'd be easier to catch you. So it was a practical thing. Um, she also cut her hair in a page boy style. Uh, but she never stopped wearing men's clothing. Right. And she she stayed in men's clothing almost up until she died. There's a there's a brief moment where, where she lapsed in the, the trial and agreed to start wearing them, but right, lasted right. for a day or two. Um so in terms of why, when she was grilled about this, she said God told her to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there there was hot debate about it at right. the time and even immediately after she passed. Um, right. There's a writing from one of the popes, <clears throat> like 20, 20, 25 years after she had passed, pointing out, like, it makes sense that she wore men's clothing because she was around men and at war. It was practical. Right. Which fit in line with a lot of the conclusions of of those who who bought into her mission, they would, they would say, Hey, this is a practical thing. You don't want to wear a dress on a horse or you don't want to climb a ladder in a horse or or climb a ladder in a dress. Um, Climbing a ladder with a horse would be. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But um, so, so they, so I think a lot of uh, theologians, they, they started, if they were convincing themselves that that's the way we would describe it, they, they found practicality in it, but they also referred to other instances where women had to dress practically like. In, right. In their if, clothing. If, if I remember correctly, there were a lot of saint stories and hagiographical stories about holy women dressing in, 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 uh, in men's clothing. And, 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 and it was, it was done for, for, for religious reasons. And, and I think maybe, I don't know how much effect that had on the theologians personally, but these sorts of narratives and, and stories and accounts would have been popular during Joan's time. So, so it may have had an impact on how they, they received Joan's account. Yeah. And so I think it's Deuteronomy 22.5, going off memory. Men shouldn't wear women's clothing and vice versa. The mm. Lord detests people who do this. Right. But as we know, any point in history, whoever's reading something from Deuteronomy they're picking and choosing which one they're going to force. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. And so Jones, Jones supporters definitely were okay with it. They, they got okay with it. Right. Her detractors in her trial, they brought up Deuteronomy 20, 22, 5, and they harped on it all the way to the end. Right. Okay. Um, so it was, it was definitely a, a hot thing. And there's, there's also evidence of theologians who, when they heard about Joan and the fact that she wears men's clothing, they questioned why why is someone coming doing this sort of thing mm-hmm. and it's a really i mean we get all kinds of of a philosophical here but like so the definition of men's clothing is going to change right from culture to culture period sure. to period sure sure um and so at the time there was not women often did not wear breeches or pants or um there, there's even evidence of women when they would work in a out in the field they would still be wearing a dress oh um i mean it's just very impractical Right. Uh, however, there was cross dressing. You could go to carnivals and see people, you know, doing it, lampooning each other. I mean, it, it's not like it was unheard of. Right. Right. Um, but women typically wore dresses and they always covered their heads. So Joan was either in breeches or she was wearing armor. And when she wasn't wearing a helmet, her her head was uncovered and it was short hair. So the hair was also shocking to people. Right. Okay. So interesting. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, then, with respect to Joan's military career, so so okay, the king is like, okay, the theologians say you're cool. I'm going to send you off to uh, to Orleans, and we're going to see we're going to see what you're made of, uh, uh, more or less. <laughs> and how exactly did? Uh, well, maybe I should back up a little bit. I mean, if we talk about Joan's military career as a whole, how much success that Joan of Arc had as a military commander? How much of that was due to her, you know? charisma or you know sense is a symbol of inspiration and how much of that was due to her own military strategy and tactics because i've heard historians get a little flippy floppy about about this particular question oh yeah and and you'll see even in the past hundred years there'll be some historians that say she was purely a figurehead and there are others say like you know kelly debris is a good one you you mentioned him earlier like he points out she understood military tactics and was studying and learning constantly right um I, I tend to be more in the latter cap, but 
with, with some caveats. So her charisma was there. And all of the people who talk about her, even the ones who helped put her to death, I mean, they, they admit she knew how to talk to people. So obviously she grew up with common folk, but she went up to the kings, all the nobility below him, soldiers, clergy. These people were enamored by her. And they tend to talk about it in very religious tones of like, you know, the way she would speak or, or they, they were just in awe of, of how God was with her. But she was convincing people of what she wanted to do. So, so that definitely played a role into it. Um, her tactics, I mean, really Joan's tactics were very aggressive. Mm, right. Very aggressive. I mean, it was, it was attack, 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 almost always. Um, right. And, and that, and that at times when, when she, she was fighting um, was the right answer. Um, there's, it, it, it plays out in Orleans in several instances, and it, it plays out at the battle of Pate, um, which she very, very famously told everyone to charge, go, go, go. And they caught the English unprepared and had an incredible victory over the English. Right. Um, but yeah, it, her, her tactics were very aggressive. Um, so she understood how to use cannons, any sort of gunpowder weapon. Um, she understood how to fill up moats and ditches, which is a very common thing that had to be done practically. So you could get across there, scaling ladders, um, and then also also riding horses and, and moving around and charging and transporting. She even understood gunpowder um, ingredients. Mm, right. Interesting. Which, it, it, like she, there's, there's a letter of her requesting specific ingredients so they can make gunpowder, is which is really interesting. Very interesting wow. understanding. And so in terms of her, and you asked me earlier, where did she learn this from? Did she learn anyone from her family? She admits that when she went to, uh, first went to Robert de Badgercourt, she didn't even know how to ride a horse. Hmm. So she, she learned all this stuff very quickly. And there's many ways we can attribute this to. I mean, we can say, well, she was truly inspired by God. Or sure. we can start to also look at things like some people are very skilled, and especially a teenager being introduced to new technology, new concepts can pick this stuff up very quickly. Mm. But the stuff she would do on a horse and they estimate in the end, she probably did about 3000 miles on a horse um, before she passed. Uh, she was using horses and maneuvering, maneuvering them in a way that like people who had grew up with horses were like, had to learn how to do. Okay. Um, and she learned how to do it in a couple months. Right. That's very interesting. And then with respect to her aggressiveness, sometimes that played in very well, you know, prior to the Dauphin's coronation, that that's really her, her, her trump card was her aggressiveness. We're going to, you know, kick the, kick, 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 kick the English out and, and et cetera. But from what I understand, after the, the time that Charles the Seventh is crowned, I could be reading this wrong, but there's almost like sort of a tension between Joan's tactics and Char and the, you know, after the crown, after the fact crowned Charles the Seventh's tactics where it, Charles almost wants to take a more diplomatic approach, whereas Joan mm -hmm. is a bit more aggressive in, in her tactics. Would, would you say that's fair? Y yes. And so there, there were folks in Charles's camp who they weren't sold on Joan from the beginning and they, they definitely wanted peace. And mm -hmm. we talked about that earlier, like how, how some people viewed this stuff, like how long can this war go on? Um, so in the, in that instance, so there were folks who were always looking for a diplomatic solution to the mm. situation. Can we, can we ally with Burgundy? I mean, he, he is your brother, right? Charles the seventh, like he's right there. Um, it, there's, there's different components that are always there, but, and, and you also asked me about Joan getting people to believe in her. Mm. She, she, even when she was successful, she had to be very aggressive in pushing for an overall strategy and approach of the war. So they relieved Orleans. They didn't start taking care of the other cities along the Loire River for almost a month. Um, and mm -hmm. she had to aggressively push Charles to say, let's, let's do this um, right. until he bought in. And then even after that, even after the victory at, at, at Pate, um, she wanted to march to Reims and had to argue for that. It was not just, you know, they weren't just saying, hey, Joan, what should we do? I mean, everyone had very varied opinions. Right. And one of the opinions was, what do you want to go to Reims for? You're already king. 
Right, exactly. <laughs> she was emphasizing, like, no, all kings are properly crowned in reams. Like, she was driving this this point down. And without using these words, she's saying, you know, this would be a very political propaganda win. Like, there's so much there. Right. Um, but right. she was able to argue effectively and convince Charles and enough people to, to do it. Right, right. Um, so, so the aggressiveness was there. But once Charles got crowned, once he experienced that moment, and Joan was a part of it. I mean, she mm. was right next to him in a suit of armor with her banner experiencing the moment. Um, there were discussions going on with the Duke of Burgundy about a, a truce or a peace. Um, and there was even negotiations of trying to convince the Duke of Burgundy to just hand over Paris. Mm. Um, so how genuine the Duke of Burgundy was, everyone always says like, there's no way Joan didn't believe it for a second. We have her in writing in a letter saying she doesn't believe these truces are real. Right. Um, she believed her next part of her mission was to take Paris. Okay. And so she was pushing aggressively for this while everyone's saying like, look, we almost got a treaty signed and we're going to get Paris just handed to us. Chill. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, right. I mean, right. it's, it, it, and you have this woman who has had amazing success and, and don't get me wrong from Orleans, even, even a little after uh, the coronation of Reims, J- Joan could do no wrong in terms of her victories. Mm. Um, there are even stories of her just setting up artillery outside of a town and the town woke up in the morning and surrendered. <laughs> oh, fire that's awesome. <laughs> right. So there was, there was something to it. And the way battles and sieges were in the medieval period, you obviously had a certain set of skill and preparedness you needed to do, but the victor was determined by God. And as long as she kept winning, people were believing. Right. Right. Okay. And then if I, you mentioned uh, her use of gunpowder technology and, and, and cannons. I mean, prior to Joan, did cannons have any particular significance as military weapons or were they even like used effectively in, in battles? I mean, what can you say to that? They, they were growing. So the, there was, there's evidence of gunpowders at Agincourt or, or, or of cannons at Agincourt, but they, I think they scared some horses is, is the report we have. There's, of course, the famous siege of uh, Harfleur with Henry V. He breached the walls with cannons and then had to storm storm it. Um, but cannons weren't to the point where they could tear down, you know, an entire structure and win. So there is evidence where, where towns would end up surrendering because they're getting bombarded so much. But uh, the siege of Orleans, which up to that point, and Kelly DeVries will tell you this one, there was more gunpowder artillery at, at Orleans than any other siege prior to that point in history okay and that went for eight months and (laughs) it took joan of arc showing up and assaulting outside fortifications to end it so it's so they're there they're prevalent but they're not deciding battles and sieges as much as they would eventually come to um funny enough at the uh siege of copenia it's another statement by kelly de which at that point had more gunpowder artillery than any other siege before. <laughs> right, he right. Made, he makes several of these. So it's like Joan, Joan was bookended by the two most gunpowder intensive sieges up to that point in history. Of course, the biggest one shortly after that would have been uh, the siege of Constantinople. Right. Which is really, we kind of see the turning point of like, oh, now artillery is on its own. Of course, fortifications would respond and change how they, they structure and lay things out to, to negate the effect of it. But um, she was definitely coming at a point where it was new technology. It was not mastered by the nobility per se. Mm-hmm. A lot of the, the folks running cannons uh, or making the gunpowder, they were from the regular class or mm-hmm. people. Um, and one of the theories of why she was so effective with gunpowder and why she understood it so well is because she easily went up and talked to some of them. Right. There's even one master gunner that we have record of at several besieges who could, who could, aim, you know, target someone with a with a smaller smaller gun and shoot them um like and he, there's records of people saying like i said take out that guy and he would point and be able to do it right. um he was from lorraine we don't know if joan actually talked with him and interacted with him but you know historians love to make these connections and say what if you know right right yeah that's very interesting that like her her i don't want to say common but like in quotation marks, common background would have actually been an asset in helping her understand and utilize gunpowder technology. Like that's a very interesting idea. That's interesting, huh? It, it really is because because if you were 
growing up as a noble, they were teaching you how to ride horses. They mm. weren't saying, now let's go shoot a gun. Or here's a big cannon. Here's how you right. mix gunpowder. I mean, you you have people that do that. Right. And a lot of times those things were forged for specific campaigns, uh, which is the case for a lot of the ones that were done for the the march down to Orleans by the English in 1428. Okay. 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 So help me sort of situate Joan from the siege of Orleans up into the, to the time of uh, the, the the coronation. How does that all pan out? And what steps occur to get, you know, Charles recognized among his supporters as the king to Charles crowned as the king? How, how does that all pan out? So, for, so the, the siege of Orleans ended in May of 1429. They crowned Charles on July 26th. Okay. So in between there, there's the relieving the, the siege of, of Orleans. There's what we call the lore campaign. And, and this was Joan and, and a group of soldiers going through. Uh, and it was the Duke of Alençon that led that campaign. Mm. Uh, Joan was there the whole time and they were essentially acting in concert. She was going to these different fortifications, slightly bigger than towns sometimes. And, they were bombarding with artillery, but often they were assaulting the walls. Um, and she was there giving either giving direction or saying what they should do. Often the Duke of Alençon, who was in Joan's camp, would listen and go along with it. Um, and she was also up on ladders carrying her banner. Even one point got hit in the head with a rock and knocked off. Right, um, right. I remember that. So uh, so there were you know several, several uh captures there of these fortifications at the siege of uh Jarjo, uh there was a massacre so once the french made it in they killed all the english defenders um and then the, and then it culminated in the battle of, of uh Pate, okay, right. where they cut the english unaware so it was like this it was about a, about a 14 day campaign i want to say off the top of my head wow. um that ended in this battle and Charles then was sending out letters celebrating it. You know, here's who we captured. Here's the cities we captured. Then this maid of Orleans, she was there. Um, mm. He was he was bragging about it. Interesting. And took took some more time, but but there was debate over what to do next. Right. Because Joan said, "March to Reims, get crowned properly." There were others saying, "No, let's march into Normandy and take this. You know, let's take this victory straight to Paris." And, and right. Go there. So there, so there was debate over what to do next. So uh, she eventually had her way. She's very persuasive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> She'd often evoke God, often evoke, you know, look what just happened. Right. Um, and then there was there was a long march to get to Reims. And on this route, we, we don't have like a full count, but it was at least 32 cities that we've been able to name that either were captured or just opened their gates. And they either overthrew Burgundians who were controlling the town or whatever, but this whole march up into Reims uh, was just a string of successes. Right. And there was, there was also one point uh, outside of uh, Troy, there was debate over what to do because the city wouldn't surrender. They wouldn't open their doors. And they stayed out there for a couple of days. And then people start pointing out the obvious. We have a good 10 to 15,000 troops we've got to feed. This can't go on forever. This is costing a fortune. Why don't we just go around? Uh, Joan insisted on attacking and mm. that, that, that comes in the story where she said, I'm going to go prepare for an attack, spent all night setting up artillery outside the, the city. And then they woke up the next morning and opened the doors and, right. and then they, they had the city. Right. So there, there are several instances of that. So 32 ish, we, we think there's more because there's several instances where the Chronicles say, you know, they list a couple of cities and they say, and more. Right. <laughs> um, so all the all these cities just started coming over to Charles, and it was just definitely a momentum that occurred. And when they got outside Reims, uh, I mean, the, the town was opened their doors, and they were ecstatic. And the Archbishop of Reims crowned Charles, and it was very celebratory. Okay. Shortly after that, the Duke of Bedford uh, wanted to confront what he saw as the growing threat, and he took the troops that were left over from the Orleans campaign. Mm -hmm. He also commandeered a group of troops that were heading off to a crusade in the Holy land. And he went out to go confront Charles and they, they actually got out on the field. They had the two armies out there, but they, they never actually had a full engagement. There was a few shots exchanged and Mm -hmm. Joan was pushing to charge and attack. And 
it just never materialized. And they eventually went their separate ways. And Charles continued to pursue diplomatic efforts with the Burgundians. Right, right. Okay, so then if I may ask, so we've got, I don't want to say the high point of Joan's military success, but definitely a significant point of Joan's military success is crowning, crowning Charles at the Reims. It's, after, it's the apex. There's, okay, it, it's the apex. It, definitely. Okay, well, after that point of Charles's co- coronation, did Joan's involvement, I and mean, we were kind of hinting at it earlier, but did Joan's involvement or influence remain steady as a military leader? Were, were there campaigns uh, that occurred afterwards that were as successful as they had been? Or w- what can you say to that? Well, so the next step for, for Joan was Paris. Okay. And she she had very she had a list of things she wanted to accomplish in what we call her mission. Um, right. But so so seeing Charles Crown was one of them. Um, so she, she, depending on who she talked to, she either described as expelling the English from France or defeating the English. But Paris was a specific line item on that list of things that she would rattle off. Okay. Um, so she, and we have this in letters, we have it in statements that she wrote. Um, so she pushed and pushed to, to take Paris. And initially they said no, because of the diplomatic discussion with the Duke of Burgundy. Hmm. When they finally signed a truce, it basically said, we won't attack your cities if you don't attack ours, mm-hmm. except for Paris. Right. So okay. Paris was on the table <laughs> and Joan kept pushing and eventually Charles said, okay. It, it wasn't done with the full might that was available. Mm. Uh, so she was given troops, but Paris is huge. I mean, right. it's much bigger than Orleans, which was the next biggest city in, in France. And uh, they they could not surround it. They you know with the with the troops they had they basically decided to target a gate, and she she genuinely believed she genuinely believed that showing up show doing a show of force there would have been people inside who would have opened the gates and and let them in and or surrendered. Right. And it didn't happen. And they had a a lengthy assault. She ended up getting wounded. It was one of her four wounds that she experienced while on campaign, but she got shot with an arrow in the leg. And there's different accounts that she was basically stuck in a ditch or, uh, or a moat oh. for the rest of the night. Um, others said she had to be dragged away, um, but, it, but it was bad and it did not go well. And the next day, uh, representatives from Charles came back to say, all right, we're calling off the siege, even though Joan wanted to keep going. Mm. Um, and they had just, updated the truce with the Duke of Burgundy and left Paris alone and okay. got to stay in, okay. in Burgundy in hands and we'll leave it at that. Right, right. Okay, well, then if I may ask, up until that point, is there any evidence, or maybe even after that point, is there any evidence of internal conflicts between Charles, well, maybe not Charles the, the, the seven specifically, but, but but like his court and Joan of Arc's mm-hmm. military involvement, like did they clash heads on? on well, yeah, they, they were, so they were clashing leading up to that. So there were some of the, the folks that were working on this truce with the Duke of Burgundy. Um, they, they did not want Joan to interfere with this. So they were pushing against attacking Paris. And once they were able to add Paris to the truce and determine a length of time for, for it, um, they said, you know, pull Joan back altogether. At that point, the Duke of Alençon wanted to go and invade Normandy. And he wanted Joan to come with her. And there were these, these men in Charles's court who convinced him not to do this. And they said, look, we can use Joan elsewhere. Right. So they actually sent Joan south to fight essentially a warlord who claimed right. he was, you know, allied with the English, uh, but he was constantly playing the English and the, and the Burgundians off each other. Uh, but he had several towns uh, down in the Southern regions that they wanted to send Joan after. Okay. And there's, there's other aspects here. Like one of the, the men in, in Charles's court, he had been captured by this warlord earlier, about 10 years prior. And he, you know, there's, there's thoughts that he still had ill feelings toward him and wanted to see something done. So they, they paired Joan up with uh, Charles de Albert, um, was another noble and military guy and and they were sent to go attack some of the cities and um they were able to capture one then they spent a, a month besieging one in december of 1429 and they could not capture it and they ended up retreating okay um then this is a really interesting point because one when, when joan was on trial they asked her 
you know, who, who told you to attack or, or when, why did God tell you to attack these cities? And you, and you didn't win. Like I asked her a question along those lines and, right. and her response was, who told you that God told me to attack those cities? Okay. Interesting. And she had, she, she continued her answer to basically say she was ordered to go there. Interesting. She was, she was being a good soldier. Right. Okay. So was she being intentionally vague about those particular cities, whether she was being ordered by the king or by divine powers? Like, like did, did she ever Definitely specify? Divine powers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because on our try, it was constantly about her interactions with, with the divine and was she really hearing real voices? And okay. if they told you to do this, then why did this happen? You know, there was always that test. So Right. 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 Uh, but okay. she, she argued that those, those things that she were doing immediately after Paris in the rest of 1429 were not, her mission or what she believed her voices were telling her to do, but she's loyal to the king. Right. Okay. The king tells her to go somewhere. She was going to do it. Right. Right. Exactly. But, okay. but she definitely thought, so she had, to, you know, there, there was time spent in, I don't want to say exile, but you know, they were trying to find a way to keep Joan occupied away from the English and the Burgundians. Mm. Um, when it got to the spring uh, or March of 1430, she was bored. And she wrote letters basically saying that and said that she is going to continue the war. And she was finding cities that had been brought over to Charles' side that had since contacted her somehow and said, we're concerned because we're surrounded by English or we're surrounded by Burgundians. She would tell them, resist, I am coming. And so starting in March, she got soldiers together and she went off and started fighting Burgundians again. Right. And it was until May where... Uh, the Duke of Burgundy besieged the town of Copenia, which was a town that had changed hands multiple times over the years, and brought his artillery there. And Joan went to go help relieve it and was going outside the town charging into the Burgundians several times until she got caught too far away and could not get back to the town and they captured him. Right. Okay. Well, then if I, if I, if I may follow up then, at that point then, what hap- what exactly happened between... Uh, after she's captured by the Burgundians, is she then handed over immediately to the English after that? No. Is, is that okay, how it goes. No, so that so there was the man who captured her. We only know we only care about him because he captures the 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 bastard of Wandom, which uh I think is a great title they're gonna have one. Right. Um, so he, he caught her secondly his his capture. Well, his leader, who was the uh Duke of Luxembourg or John of Luxembourg, um who was subservient to the Duke of Burgundy. Um, he he paid John. It was now his captive. So he basically paid a ransom for her. Um, and he kept her for a while. And there's even an account of him teasing Joan, saying, What if I, you know, what if I just ransom you to 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 the French? And she gave she gave a retort along the lines of, No one's gonna let you do that. You don't have the power to do that. Mm-hmm. Um and so she said some nasty things about the English and there was a English knight present who tried to assault her. And like someone had to stop, hold them back. Right. What did you say? Um, she, she definitely understood the concept of, of ransoming. She even had someone that she had captured that she hoped to negotiate and get some prisoners back from the, the English and the Burgundians. And so she, she understood like you get someone the worth money, but she was ultimately sold uh, in November of 1430 to the English for 10,000 livres, which is a literal king's ransom. So anyone who gets, I don't, I don't know how much listeners know this, but anyone who gets captured, you can do whatever you want to with them in terms of selling, keeping them indentured or whatever. But right. if the king shows up, if he pays you the king's ransom amount, which was 10,000 livres at the time, uh, it's his. Okay. And that's what was done with the Duke of Orleans when he was captured at Agincourt. Um and there were several other people who went through this. So, so Joan and the, and funny enough, some, some friends and I went through and tried to calculate what 10,000 livre would be today. And you take, you know, how many, how, you know, how many grams and pounds of right, silver and do right, the conversion. Right. It's almost half a million in today's dollars. Oh, wow. Okay. So this, so this is what the English paid to get her. And so, so that's, so when we say handed over, yeah, they, they had to pay for it. Right. Um, whether or not John of Luxembourg would have ever sold her to the French, I, I doubt it. I, there's no evidence that he ever made any overtures or that it was ever an option. Um, okay. 
Yeah. In interesting. But eventually she does get captured by the Burgundians and then she's turned over to the English though, right? Or I don't remember Correct. how exactly the, yeah, so the Burgundians, the, the Burgundians capture at Copenia uh, and John of Luxembourg, who's one of the Burgundians, he, he holds on to her till November when he officially ransoms her to the English. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then she's transported to Rouen and then she's handed over to the church there to be put on inquisition. Okay. Interesting. With the understanding if she's found innocent, they would give her back to the English. So then if, if I may ask, uh, wh why exactly did the English officially try her for, I believe it is heresy that, that, that they accuse her of. And how exactly does, does, does that pan out her, her canonical trial? Well, so there were several people who were very interested in what Joan of Arc had done and accomplished. So the University of Paris, which they were training all sorts of clergy of all different levels. Right. Uh, they took a strong interest in what Joan had done. She had assaulted their own city. Um, they were, they, the way they worded it, they were concerned for her and her soul. Okay. And what they had heard about what she was professing, having encountered, you know, divine visions or voices or whatever they were getting secondhand, they wanted to get to the bottom of. Mm. And so when Joan of Arc was captured by the Burgundians, within about a month, they were reaching out to the Duke of Burgundy, John of Luxembourg and others saying, we would like, we would like to conduct an inquisition on Joan on some of these charges. These are grave charges and we want to get to the bottom. Of it. Mm. There was a lot of convincing and there was even some deriding uh, at the local um, bishop who, who would have been one of the people to lead the inquisition about his inability to get Jo to acquire Joan as a prisoner for the trial. And so it was a lot of pushing and prodding. Now, keeping in mind, Henry VI at this time was, was still a child. So these interactions are going to the regents or the people in, in the court um, representing England and France, trying to convince them that this is the right route to go. Mm. Um, but ultimately the English decided to do it. And it's definitely with the understanding of, okay, you'll put her on an inquisition whatever happens, if she's found innocent, you're going to hand her back as a prisoner. Right. Okay. Well, that, that was a question that I had. I mean, it, why didn't uh, Charles uh, the seventh intervene when she was handed over? I mean, I, I just asked this just because it seems like Joan would have been a politically like important asset to them, or did he not see as important at the time? Could he have ransomed or re-ransomed? I don't know how that would work. I mean, so the the most famous prisoner in English captivity up to that point was the Duke of Orleans, and okay. they were not selling him. I mean, they he he I, he was captive of them for gosh, thirty years before he was finally released, maybe more. Mm. Um, so there's definitely a, scenarios where someone becomes a captive, and that's just their life from now on. Um, but in terms of like why he didn't intercede, there's there's a lot of you know post medieval. Uh, thoughts and rantings about this and Charles is usually portrayed as someone who's who's very dopey and inept and he was Joan had done what he needed he had his crown so he didn't need anything more oh, okay um they're also talking about the guy who would spend the next 20 years defeating the English entirely on the continent but uh that's beside the point um so we don't have any direct evidence or any, any surviving evidence that that Charles tried to intervene tried to make overtures to to get a hold of her we do have, there's a letter from, from one of the clergy who had written Charles saying like, you can't let her be tried for heresy and let this go on. You need to do something. But there's no evidence of what came of that. Right. Um, and, and the question we have to ask ourselves, and you know, we pull out a map and look at the situation. She was in Rouen, which is in very Northern France, deep within English controlled territory. To go and get her is going to be a campaign of epic proportions, much right. larger than just marching to Reims. Right. Um, I mean, it's, and it's not a matter of sending in some people to sneak in and crack the gate and sneak <laughs> right. her out. I mean, she was deep within territory. And, and, mm. and Rouen, uh, after Paris, was the main city of the English in, in France. It was well fortified. Um, there were plenty of soldiers around. It was not something you just go to. Um, the other, there's also some hopeful thinking that some of the soldiers in Jones' camp, like Lahir is one of the names that's usually dropped, that they were trying to do some sort of surprise sneak attack to try and get her. Right. Um, 
all we have is conjecture based on them being in certain towns that could have possibly made the trek, but there's no evidence that they actually tried to do anything. Right. Right. Okay. Um, but it's all very romanticized now. And, and so, so it's, it's very hard to get through that, that medievalism narrative of Charles, which is just this young King that just like, all right, I'm done with Joan. Let's move on. Right. But the other thing to point out is Joan had technically gone you know, gone off the rails here by conducting her campaigns the way she was conducting no one told her to go to Campania and try to relieve that city right that was of of her Mm -hmm. own accord right right it'd be one thing own accord in some of the battle sorry go ahead no no it it would be one thing if if if, uh i don't know the mercenary that she's sent down to southern france to battle with it would be one thing if something happened to joan there i mean that was that is a that is a fascinating thing to bring up yeah, they well, yeah. that would have been a very uh, doable campaign. I mean, that would that would have been meaning getting more troops, but like those towns were in accessible areas that weren't surrounded by a ton of of territory uh, protecting it. I mean, yeah, jo- Joan was unsuccessful in her that final siege there in December of fourteen twenty nine due to lack of supplies and troops. Mm. So in theory, if she were captured there and held there, yeah, that's something that Charles could have very easily intervened in and handled. Okay. I see. Rouen was not a town to just go to. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. Well, well and, and and because it's be, 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 because Rouen's uh, so heavily fortified by English and it's an English territory, how much of her canonical trial and how much of her inquis, inquisition was it a result of? Was it primarily consisted of English clerics or was it French clerics with English? Oh, so it was so- almost entirely French. Oh, interesting. Okay. There was only a handful of, of English involved. Okay. Um, but yeah. So, so yeah, that's, and, and that's, that's the real fascinating part about this. And, and especially as you, as you get deeper and deeper in the layers of Joan's story, I mean, she was tried and found guilty by French and they, they had a, they had a list of grievances. They, there was actually 70 to start with. They ruled it down to 12, but among the list of articles were, her propensity for war Mm. she is continuing the war this is you know from their perspective god does not want this war to continue christians are killing christians Mm. you know they're not killing you know whatever they thought they should be killing at the time heretics saracens right you you name it like they had certain lists that were okay but christians killing christians not okay and we understand how this war started but here's where it's at and we can just keep things as they are at the status quo and call a peace Charles can stay to his territory in the South clearly up here is now part of England. Right. Um, okay. Some of these people on, on the trial, we have records and they were paid for their services by the English. Uh, okay. And of course we want to infer like, well, if you were paid by the English, clearly you're going to set, you know, side with them. But um, there are records of, of English intervening. Um, definitely the, so, so an inquisition at this time, this institution was something that was ran by a local bishop and the inquisitor of the, the country or region. And they were basically the two judges, okay, both French. Um, and then they would go through and they would assign all the various roles that need to go through um, the, you know, the, the scribes, you know, who's the promoter, who, you know, all this stuff. And the one role that's always absent at this time, there's no concept of a, you know, representation for the defendant. They're on the right. Road. Right. So all, all those roles were held by French. And then it was an open trial for the most part where they held these sessions publicly and anyone could show up. And everyone had heard of Joan of Arc. I mean, the, the Holy Roman Emperor had heard of Joan of Arc at this point. Like mm. people were fascinated by her. And so people were showing up, even if it was just for a day. And in the trial records, there's long lists every day in the room these people in these roles and we also have in attendance and they would like list them out with their titles and what degrees they had and things like that mm-hmm. it's a very very ceremonial and, and process thing but it was predominantly french running this trial interesting well then if i may ask i mean <clears throat> i know you mentioned that one of their biggest grievances was that she was continuing on with the war and they're like please don't please stop um but but another another the concerns that they initially had, the, the, the Parisian French theologians had with her cross-dressing where they they saw pre- enough precedent where they said, okay, fine, you, you can wear this for pragmatic reasons. This was 
an issue that that was brought up in this trial and mm-hmm. it was more of a problem then is is that correct a- absolutely yeah and and it, and it all kind of connects to each other right so she why are you wearing men's clothing like my voice has told me to who are your voices and and so they would go down the spiral initially she wouldn't tell them mm-hmm. what do you mean you won't tell us i mean heck if we even get technical initially they wanted to you know they asked her the basic question will you tell us the truth and she said, I will tell you what my voices will allow me to tell you. So like they couldn't even like get initial, you know, the basic ceremonial stuff out of the way. It just, it just seemed like she was being obstinate. Right. And then they would ask her, you know, everyday questions that people talk about all the time. Like, do you believe that the church militant is God's representative? Like, as though that's a term that everyone uses all the time. Right. Exactly. Um, and, you know, and there's, there's, they would use this term constantly. And there's, there's a lot of debate whether she ever understood it at any point. Mm. Um, but what she always kept saying is she, she, she would say, I'm, I am subservient to, to God and the church. They're like, mm-hmm. yes, but what about the church militant? You know, and they would, they would go in circles on this. So right. she's wearing men's clothing. Her voice has told her to do it. Oh, you're hearing voices. Who are these voices? I'm not going to tell you. Then, then she finally tells them you're basically in a scenario where you, regardless if she's wearing men's clothing or she's continuing war, she's claiming voices from God are telling her to do it. If they aren't voices from God, we got a problem, right? right? So that's how they kept looking at it and wording it and saying, we are here to help you and your soul. Are you a heretic? Are you, you know, like a, that, that's right. that's when they start getting all that terminology and it all remains connected. Right. So it's, it's not so much that, in, at least at this stage of, of the, the process, it's not so much that she's wearing men's clothing, but she's wearing men's clothing because certain voices told her to. And that's why at least as for what I'm hearing from you, that's why it's as big of a problem. I think it's a double, okay, <laughs> but okay. she, but if she tried to make the case, I was wearing men's clothing for practical reasons, she might be get, be able to get them to stop. But then she also has the problem of, well, why won't you put on men's clothing right now? Oh, okay. And she said, I'll put on men's clothing. If you'll hear my confession, I'm like, okay. well, we can't hear your confession until we finish the acquisition. So then they go in circles there, you know, it's just okay. an endless loop. Um, Lots of gotcha questions on her. Right. Well, I mean, as I understand it, was that I'm not I'm not a legal uh, a medieval legal expert by any stretch of the imagination. But wasn't that a tactic of inquisitors that they tried to put you in a box where you'd have to say something that you shouldn't have said? And that would be what, what would get you. Like, like I remember Bernard Gui had like a list of like what you're supposed to say in like an inquisitorial. And like you're supposed to get them to a point where they mess up and they say something they shouldn't say. And boom, you've got them. Yeah, they they certainly tried to find inconsistencies in her story. Mm. And one, one of the things she, there's some very famous responses that she gave. And this is one of the things where I talk about her charisma, even mm. in captivity, she blew people away. Um, so one of the questions that they asked her is, are you in a state of grace? Right. Trick question. There's no answer to this question. And her answer was, if I am, may God keep me there. Brilliant. And there were, right. and there were people, several people years later remembered this answer. And they're like, this is the most brilliant answer we'd ever heard. Like they were, they were floored by it, but there were several instances of, of that uh, where she would give that sort of response and they, you, they would get frustrated and then they would even drop a topic because they were as well, we're not going to get around this. Let's move on to this. Very um, so, and there were several, of them. one of them was uh, horseback riding, not a common thing for, for women to do at the time. Okay. And so they tried to go down this route. Like, where did you learn to horseback ride? Did you learn from soldiers? Did you learn from, were you hanging out with men to learn this? Like they were asking those types of questions. So then they realized it wasn't going anywhere and they end up dropping it. Right, right, right. Okay. Well, how exactly did the, her inquisition end? As I understand it, they ended up initially convincing her to relapse from her heresy or, or however you, you, you want to uh, phrase it. And <laughs> it worked for like, a short period of time. I, I think you said like, how long was it? Like a day or two that, that, that it worked. And then she, re, then she relapsed and then, then they're like, okay, what are we going to do now? Yeah. And I, I always like to lay it out a little for folks because when, the, when you, whoever you ask how long the trial of Joan of Arc is, you're going to get a different answer. So from her perspective, up to the point where she was executed, she'd been in captivity for over a year and had spent four months answering questions ad nauseum. But, there's different stages of the trial because initially the question, when they were questioning her for, I think it was about seven or 10 sessions, 
they were just trying to gather evidence to be like, okay, if we bring a case against her, what's going to be? So like, it wasn't even officially a trial. It was, they would call it like the preparatory trial. That's what historians tend to call it today. But uh, from January up through May, and there were periods where there was intense questioning that would last a week or two. And then there were long periods where she's just sitting in a cell. And, and when I say sitting in a cell, they had, they'd kept her chained because she had tried to escape at one point. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it was just very much her sitting around waiting and then they would show up, have a very big ceremony and talk about the next stage of whatever just happened in the trial. And then she has to respond to stuff or not, you know, and she's just sitting there watching. It's just continually going. So they tried several things to get her to confess, you know, get her to admit she was wrong or, or, or whatever. So they, they took her into a torture room and showed her a series of devices and even had a torturer there on hand to threaten her and say, this is what awaits you. Um, she made one of her famous statements that said, even if I was torn asunder by horses, I would not forsake my voices. You know, that, right. that type of response. Um, they even debated using torture on Joan um, and had a vote. There was, it was mostly against, and, and the re the most logical, the, the, the reason that was most commonly given was along the lines of, this has been a really good trial. We don't want to tarnish it with torture at this point, do we? Oh, my but, God. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there were several people who voted in favor. They said, this will speed things up. Let's do it. Um, but they ultimately didn't. Okay. Um, they brought her, where, where they finally got her, they, they had several moments where they would bring her in and say, we're going to bring in brother so-and-so, and he's going to preach to you about why you're wrong, and he's trying to help your soul. And he would come in and give an impassioned message. And some of the stuff was recorded almost word for word, or they would at least catch the highlights of it mm. in the trial transcript. But she'd have to sit here and listen to this. Um, you know, she had, she had misled everyone. You're hearing voices. They're clearly not from God. They've told you to do these crazy things. Let us help your soul. You know, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, what finally got her is when they brought her out and had a pyre set up for a burning uh, and had a, the executioner standing there and they started reading basically her excommunication, finding her guilty uh, of heresy. And she finally cried out and said that, all right, she'll sign whatever. And she signed an abjuration and there's different, there's all different accounts of this. So we have eyewitness accounts and then we have some paper that has uh, survived in the trial tra transcripts with some people dispute. It's not necessarily what she signed. Regardless, the account of her signing it, she didn't even sign her name. Um, she said she said she couldn't, which we have her signature in letters, which wasn't true. But um, someone actually grabbed her hand and like forced it, you know, right. a circle. And someone just des described watching her do it with a smirk. Um, whether or not that that's what everyone else saw, like, right. um, but the agreement was she would stop wearing men's clothing. She would uh, admit that her voices were not from God and stop claiming that she's talking to him. And she would spend her days in a basically an ecclesiastical prison guarded by women. And she'd be able to go and go to mass and do confessional and all that stuff. Right, right. A couple of days went by. She was still kept in the English controlled prison with English guards. And the story that she told people is that the English guards took her clothes and they leave her chained to a bed. And so she's essentially in her undergarments mm -hmm. and she needs to relieve herself. Well, to relieve herself, she didn't do it in her cell. They would open the cell and escort her to another place where she could do it. Right. They took her clothes. And so she's stuck there and they would not give her clothes, but they had a stack of, of men's clothing in the cell. And apparently she waited for hours trying to get them to give her a dress, begging them. Right. And finally she was in so much pain. She put on clothes and, went in so she could relieve herself right right okay so then then the, the assessors and some of the people involved with the trial heard did you hear jones wearing men's clothing again they like well, no this can't be so they they rush they rush over to see her and not only is she wearing men's clothing but she's saying she was wrong to stop wearing men's clothing and she should have never forsaken her voices and her voices came to her and told her that she was wrong to do that and okay. it was these statements that said, wow, not only is she, was she a heretic, she's now a relapse heretic. We're done. Right. And then the next day they brought everyone in who was involved with the trial and everyone 
voted to a T to condemn her as a relapsed heretic, which meant she is then handed over to secular authorities, or in this case, the English, who can have their own trial. Right. But the description we get is they they did the ceremony, and once it was official, English guards grabbed her, took her up to the pyre, and set it, and, and burned her. Never right. had a trial or anything. Right. And it, it even got to the point where I, I don't think that they allowed her remains to, like, be buried. Like, the, 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 didn't they dump them in refuse or something? Because they didn't want, you know, people to find relics yeah, or they, something. Or... Yeah. And it's even there's there's some there was very public gruesome descriptions of this that that made it outside of, of Rouen. Um, but they talked about how they started the fire. They had her up higher than typical um, so people could see her burning. So mm. she usually what happens at this point is the executioner will give someone a knockout blow, like a sympathy thing, uh, and then start the fire. But she didn't actually get the burn. So she, most, most historians believe that she died of, of uh, suffocation or oh, inhalation okay. of smoke. Um, but once it had burned a bit and it had fallen down, they actually, before continuing the fire, the executioner went over and, and kicked it around so they could see her charred naked body. Oh, um, and that account is in several places that made it outside of Rwanda. So it was a story that was going around. Right. Um, they finished the fire and then they took the remains and they threw it into the Seine River. But canonically, that wasn't the end of the story, though, right? I mean, eventually that, that condemnation gets reversed. And, and, and or <laughs> how exactly did, does that come out? I don't want I don't want to take too much of your time. But I just want to ask, like, eventually, like, it's it, the, the, the narrative is slipped on its head. And it's actually that the trial was it a mistrial? Was it a mis? Was there wrong evidence? Like, how did that all go out? Yeah, and this is. I, and by the way, I have all the time in the world to talk about Joan of Arc. So, um, the this is an interesting development because the war continues after this, and eventually Charles captures Rouen, and so with Rouen comes many of the local clergy who were involved with the trial, and all the documentation. And this was in 1449, 1450. And Charles put in a formal request uh, to, to say, I want to I want to revisit this trial. I want to understand how it was conducted, what was said, because afterwards the English uh, were thumping their chest, bragging about taking care of this heretic. And her association with Charles proves that he ain't the rightful king of anything. Right. I mean, the, he's, the he's got a very got all his dick. Yeah, he's got a very like he's got skin in the game, so to speak, of, of trying to. He definitely does. And there were def there's definitely records of people talking to him with, it is wrong that this woman who was so involved with your victories early on is a heretic. That doesn't sound right. And right. it doesn't look, it's not a good look, as we would say. So once they got, once they got to Rouen, they were able to get the records. And there became very concerted, methodical efforts uh, by various people who would sit down and read these meticulously. And by the way, these trial records we had any way to describe this. This is the trial of the century. Um, every Joan was a sensation. Everybody was talking about her. And after her trial, there was a council where many many of the people who were involved with the trial then went to. So they shared their experience with everybody. And it, the news just traveled. And so there's more documentation on Joan of Arc's trial than any other trial in the medieval period. Um, reams and reams of it. And part of it is because of the people who conducted the trial wanted to show that what they did was appropriate and right and they followed all the right procedures mm -hmm. and the fact that it lasted well over four months technically um so after the trial they took the minutes they sat down methodically translated them into latin made five copies three of which survived today and, and and distributed them so so they started reading these and, and looking at the notes and they immediately found discrepancies they found at certain points where uh joan wasn't allowed to do something which clearly people in her place would have been allowed to do one of the more common things was she appealed directly to the Pope and their response was, well, the Pope's too far away. We represent him because we're the church militant. Mm. What say you, you know, um, which was like a clear, clear violation of her rights. Um, there was also when they had finished writing up their articles of accusation against Joan, um, they did, they did 70 initially questioner on them. Then they wrote, they condensed it down to 12 didn't talk to her about those 12 and took those and sent it to the university of Paris. And they spent weeks reading over them and writing their opinions. Well, based on what you're telling us, here's what we think about this heretic. Yeah. Um, and then that was just read aloud to, aloud to Joan and she wasn't allowed to respond. 
which was another discrepancy they found in the trial. Okay. Um, so th- th- this, they, they spent about six years examining this. Oh, wow. And there were different groups of people who would come in, like they would, like, all right, I've worked on this for a couple of years. Now I'm going to hand it over to Cardinal so-and-so, and he's going to take it on. And, and they became earnestly involved. There were several appeals to the Pope, and the Pope changed over a couple of times. But it was in 1455 that the Pope officially answered a call said, okay, we're going to do an official look at this trial. And up to then, there had been several sets of interviews and examinations they had done with people involved. But then they just said, let's look at Joan as a person. And they sent people to her hometown. They sent people to Orleans, people in Rouen, Paris, and interviewed people. How did you know Joan? You know, when did you know her? And they, they they asked them all the same set of questions and wrote them down, of course, in Latin for the most part. Um, and then used all that. And then there were also people who were just writing about Joan and what they thought of what she did. And, you know, the, um, what, what was the, uh, you know, biblical backing of it, the, you know, all all that type of stuff. And these things are massive. And so people involved with examining this trial, they would go and inquire from them and get their official writings and include it in the record. So like, here's another one, like this, this what we call it the nullification proceedings and eventually the nullification trial. Um, <clears throat> it's a massive amount of text and it's volumes of work. And a lot of times it's, you know, here's here's a theologian so-and-so who has has written 30 pages on Joan's clothes. And it's all there. Right. Um, and, and then the people who knew her, you know, some people who fought with her, grew up with her. There are some people who definitely just, yeah, she passed by. I don't know anything. And they every question they ask, like, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but they interviewed uh, hundreds of people uh, to 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 get to get all these uh, answers, and so they they had like an official trial. There was someone defending, and and ultimately the conclusion of that nullification trial is they nullified the verdict of her original Inquisition trial. Okay. Um, and there's there's different ways to look at, it. and it's in the past it's been called the rehabilitation trial of Joan. I think historians. Uh, for the most part, I moved away from that verbiage because it didn't rehabilitate Joan. It just nullified the guilty verdict she got as a relapsed heretic. And right, right, right. That. So, so that basically absolved the Catholic Church of that incident. And, you know, there, there's you know, the, the opinion on Joan is still open to interpretation immediately after that. But, well, I mean, popularly, I mean, she does eventually develop a cult of sainthood around her. Uh, yeah. And the, the, the the cult of Joan started with the, the victory at Orleans. Okay. They started having a yearly celebration on the day that that siege was lifted. And that went, that has gone uninterrupted except for a short period during the uh, French revolution. And at Emperor Napoleon, Emperor Bonaparte brought it back into to flavor and used it as a propaganda symbol to say, we're going to continue these yearly, re- you know, celebrations. Right, right, right. And, and today, there's there's still they do parades in in Orleans and have someone dressed as Joan of Arc, and it's a big event. So so it started there, and there's other towns that she was involved with too that started similar celebrations. But yeah, that that started early, and it and it just continued to grow, and it definitely exploded in the 1800s when a lot of this material became more accessible to people, and people got in the archives and found the trial records. The the nullification records and started publishing them in accessible formats to people and right. people knew the story of Joan of Arc but now they started getting the details and that really started the interest in in revving up the cult of, of Joan as a saint with respect to Joan's legacy how significant was Joan of Arc's involvement in bringing to an end or maybe that's the wrong way of phrasing it but but but, but at least like culminating the hundred years war did did, did her invo- involvement how, what, what can you say to that? Uh, yeah, so that that's one that historians will quibble over it. And it, you know, it goes back to how you define the hundred years war, how you define yeah, those yeah, periods, yeah. but like um, the curmudgeons, um, I won't name names. They'll tell you that, you know, okay, Joan had some success and did, did some things, but ultimately other than helping Charles get this crown, um, there wasn't much to it because uh, some of the work that she did was even undone shortly after because these cities that surrendered ended up going back mm. to the English and Burgundians. But um, it was it was another five years after she was executed that 
the Anglo-Burgundian alliance and essentially the French Civil War finally fell apart. Mm -hmm. Um, And it wasn't until 1453 that the Hundred Years' War came to an end as we try to compartmentalize that whole whole series of events. Um, But certainly it... Sorry, it, it's certainly so that's, the, that's the curmudgeon answer, for sure. right? Right, right. But, but I'm just thinking, like, certainly, I mean, crowning Charles, at least as a political symbol, that had to have had a positive effect oh, for, for sure. And, and so, by the way, I give you that one because then there's the flip side, which is Joan changed the course of the Hundred Years' War, which also might be extreme. I think it's somewhere in the middle where she definitely demonstrated how you could beat the English. Um, had had a string of victories, stopped the English from advancing south of the Lower River because if the English had captured Orleans, which whether or not that would have happened or whether they'd been able to, there's debate over that. But if they had actually taken that stronghold, Charles and Charles and his his territories are now south of the Lower River. It's much harder to to keep pushing north and, and keep getting out there. Um, but by doing this, she started challenging what was becoming the norm in northern France of okay. We are we are ruled by the King of England, and anyone who dis- disputes that, you know, they're going against the will of God or whatever. Like she challenged that narrative, mm. um, and a lot of the people that she fought alongside, they would go on to continue the fight. Sometimes they weren't always loyal to Charles, but like they continued going in the war. Um, so, I, I think I think when when I hear the the curmudgeon statements and they come up still, um, but they they started very early on in the the 1900s as well um it's just shocking i just think you're being you're being a little uh you're being a little silly like right exactly yeah to to think that this did not have an effect and didn't do anything um but they so i think you could just look at how people talked about her at the time and what they felt about her because they would have certainly attributed the successes that she had to her and her her charisma and her inspiration from god and all that um but but even after things were done, after the war was over in 1455 and 1456, people who knew her and interacted with her were speaking glowingly of her ability to lead troops and, and do these things. They would have attributed their continued success to her. Um, you know, so it's 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 interesting. It's a very there's always a complex answer. There's never an easy answer to these questions, but oh sure, sure, exactly. Well, if I may also ask uh, maybe as a as a a few closing questions. Do you have any recommended recommendations for those who'd want to learn more about Joan of Arc or maybe the, again, in quotation marks, hundred years war in general? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so for Joan, there's, I mean, there's, there's the books you're always going to find in libraries and some of them I'd be like, Oh man, don't start with that one. But um, I think probably if, if someone's like, I really want to know about Joan of Arc, where do I start? I'd probably recommend Craig Taylor's, uh, I think it's called Joan of Arc La Pucelle. Um, La Pucelle being French for the maid or the virgin. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that one is a great book because he gives a great intro at the beginning, uh, just talking about the life and legacy of Joan. And then it is full of original documents that he's translated in English. Uh, her le- has every single one of her letters, has chunks of the, the Inquisition trial, the nullification proceedings, and then other letters and things documents that people published about joan it, it's it is the best most accessible reference we have in english to those sorts of documents okay um and then after that i meant i mentioned kelly devry i mean if they're into the military stuff joan of arc military leader that was one of the first books i i read on joan of arc that enthralled me um okay that's a great read and really gives some great context of joan and the hundred years war um and then i also mentioned uh Gail yeah, Orgelfinger's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Joan of Arc and English Imagination. Great book. I think it came out in 2009. Um, that is another fantastic book to read in terms of not just Joan in the war, but then understanding how people have perceived her over the past five, 600 years, uh, specifically from the English perspective of the people who she fought. So that's, it's a, it's a really interesting take. In it. And to me, I think it's a great way to open the world of, Joan of Arc in medievalism or, or since the medieval ages or the, the middle ages. Right, right. No, no, because I mean, we, we, we might just like focus more so on uh, the fact of the, the cult of sainthood that that develops around her. But she also becomes, you know, in, in the coming centuries, something of, of a nationalist symbol, if that makes sense, or. 
Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot to talk about there. So um, someone, someone asked me this question, like how do they, how do French people view Joan and probably, uh, and I know, I don't know if you're originally from Ireland or that's just where you're going to school, but in, in America, like what I tell people, I, I'm like, well, how do you view George Washington? Right. Okay. And, and that's not an easy answer, right? Because some people they're like, well, Washington, he created, he created America. Yeah. You know? Right. Or, you know, Washington owned slaves and he treated some of them like, like a jerk. And while others would be like, why would you even bring that up? Why, why do you even talk about that? So, so there's, there's varying opinions on, on Joan the same way. I think you, you find uh, some, some people tired of talking about her, but it, you can't go to a town in France without seeing a road named after her statue. Right. right um, exactly. But she has been hijacked like any nationalist symbol, uh, ha- you know, mm-hmm. can be. She's kind of, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, agnostic. Uh, she's not. She's not harmful in any way in America, right? Um, the word I'm looking for is going to hit me as soon as we get off this call. Um, no, so it's, it's fine. We we think of Joan of Arc. She's either religious or you're like, oh, she was a historical woman. Like, but there's no political connotation there. Uh, in France, the the far right has definitely adopted her as a symbol. Um, right. They see her as someone who should represent their crusade against invading immigrants, okay. and you can imagine where that line of talk goes. Right. Um, okay. But they they'll have yearly uh, events in front of her statue or statues and rail against immigrants in France. Okay. Wonderful. So <laughs> um, she's a national symbol. She's she's seen as as helping, you know, being part of France becoming what it is today. But she is also a nationalist right in, symbol, right? right yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's all over the spectrum over there, right? Right. That that makes sense. It, it, and of course, she's a religious icon, like the, the right. Of course, is still there, right? Of course. And 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 if I remember correctly, I know you you mentioned briefly uh, the fact that uh, the changing narratives of how the English have viewed her. If I'm not mistaken, there's this English metal band that made a song about her, I'm kind of, is it raven age or the raven age and they made a song about her and like it actually sounds really cool and it's like this is an english band why are they like why are they praising <laughs> this woman <laughs> yeah i and i know what you're talking about because people always send me that one and i end up listening to it every time yeah. uh yeah it's 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 weird i think a, the english have might have a different perspective today like they definitely know who she was but if i ask someone like you ever think about the English culpability and ensuring Joan of Arc was executed? Like they might be like, wait, what? <laughs> right. Um, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's not for that yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. That, 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 that makes sense. So, so one other one worth mentioning, and this is again, Joan outside of the middle ages and more the reception of her. Um, there's more films on Joan of Arc second only to the life of Christ. So okay. like we, and, and I could give you random stats like that. that will keep blowing your mind, but yeah. So, and it, the numbers up in the fifties now, and some of them are lost because they, you know, they were, they're so old. In fact, the oldest one was made by Thomas Edison in the 1800s, but more films on her than anyone else, but Jesus. Uh, so there's a lot written about Joan of Arc in film. Uh, the most recent piece written that kind of gives like a good uh, overview of it is uh, Kevin J. Hardy in a volume called medieval women on film. He's got an essay of Joan of Arc. Uh, in film and it, it does a great job of covering the breadth uh, and it was just published a couple of years ago so it's pretty fresh and you know there's of course in 10 years it'll be like it need to be updated again but that's sure. the latest one that's out there if people are interested of, of how she's been portrayed in, in in movies okay cool okay I'll put, I'll put those in the link description okay cool and then um Okay, Scott, this has been an amazing interview. Thank you so much for, <laughs> for coming on. Um, if, if, Thank if you. I, if I can ask uh, a question for the gentle listeners, um, where 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 should 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 we go to find your work or or, or, or your research or any any any, any uh, place where we can find you? Well, yeah. So I so I do have a website, uh, scottmanning.com. Thank God, it's so so easy to say. Um, and of course, I've got blog posts on there from ages ago. But there is a section on publications and things like that. But um my i have my book you mentioned joan of arc a reference guide to her life and works yeah yeah i should should tell people it's an encyclopedia and the publisher did price it like an encyclopedia so i okay. if you see it and decide not to buy it i understand but um it's out there and then um any of the the published works that are like in journals and 
places like that, if you can't get access to them through like an institution or something, if you email me, I'll send you a PDF. Just don't tell anybody. Okay. <laughs> but right. Feel free to ask. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Well, Scott, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.